Chapter 19 Treasure Unbelievable riches. He could not believe the contents of the survival pack. The night before, he was so numb with exhaustion, he couldn't do anything but sleep. All day in the water had tired him so much that in the end, he had fallen asleep sitting against his shelter wall, oblivious even to the mosquitoes, to the night, to anything. But with false gray dawn, he had awakened instantly and began to dig into the pack to find amazing, wonderful things. There was a sleeping bag which he hung to dry over his shelter roof on the outside, and a foam sleeping pad, an aluminum cook set with four little pots, and two frying pans. It actually even had a fork, a knife, and spoon. A waterproof container with matches and two small butane lighters. A sheath knife with a compass in the handle, as if a compass would help him, he thought, smiling. A first aid kit with bandages and tubes of antiseptic paste and small scissors. A cap that said Cessna across the front in large letters. Why a cap, he wondered? It was adjustable and he put it on immediately. A fishing kit with four coils of line, a dozen small lures, and hooks and sinkers. Incredible wealth. It was like all the holidays in the world. All the birthdays there were, he sat in the sun by the doorway where he had dropped the night before and pulled the presents, as he thought of them, out, one at a time, to examine them, turn them in the light, touch them, and feel them with his hands and eyes. Something that at first puzzled him, he pulled out what seemed to be the broken off, bulky stock of a rifle and he was going to put it aside, thinking it might be for something else in the pack. When he shook it and it rattled, after working at it a moment, he found the butt of the stock came off, and inside there was a barrel and magazine, an action assembly with a clip, and a full box of 50 shells. It was a 22 survival rifle. He had seen one once in the sporting goods store where he went for bike parts and the barrel screwed onto the stock. He had never owned a rifle, never fired one, but had seen them on television, of course, and after a few moments figured out how to put it together by screwing the action into the stock, how to load it and put the clip full of bullets into the action. It was a strange feeling holding the rifle. It somehow removed him from everything around him. Without the rifle, he had to fit in to be part of it all, to understand it and use it, the woods, all of it. With the rifle, suddenly he didn't have to know, didn't have to be afraid or understand. He didn't have to get close to a fool bird to kill it, didn't have to know how it would stand if he didn't look at it and move off to the side. The rifle changed him the minute he picked it up, and he wasn't sure if he liked the change very much. He set it aside leaning it carefully against the wall. He could deal with the feeling later. The fire was out and he used a butane lighter and a piece of birch bark with small twigs to get another one started, marveling at how easy it was, but feeling again that the lighter somehow removed him from where he was. What he had to know. With a ready flame, he did not have to know how to make a spark nest or how to feed the new flames to make them grow, as with the rifle, he wasn't sure he liked the change. Up and down, he thought, the pack was wonderful, but it gave him up and down feelings. With the fire going and sending up black smoke and a steady roar from pitch-smelling chunk he put on, he turned once more back to the pack, rummaging through the food packets. He hadn't brought them out yet because he wanted to save them until last. Glory in them. He came up with a small electronic device completely encased in plastic bag. At first, he thought it was a radio or a cassette blader, and he had a surge of hope because he missed music. Missed sound. Missed hearing another voice. But when he opened the plastic and took the thing out and turned it over, he could see it wasn't a receiver at all. 
There was a coil of wire held together on the side by tape, and it sprung into a three-foot-long antenna when he took the tape off. No speaker, no lights, just a small switch at the top and on the bottom he finally found the small print, emergency transmitter. That was it. He turned the switch back and forth on a few times, but nothing happened. He couldn't even hear static. So, as with the rifle, he set it against the wall and went back to the bag. It was probably ruined in the crash, he thought. Two bars of soap? He had bathed regularly in the lake, but not with soap, and he thought how wonderful it would be to wash his hair. Thick with grime and smoke dirt, frizzed by the wind and sun, matted with fish and fool bird grease, his hair had grown and stuck and tangled and grown until it was clumped mess on his head. He could use the scissors from the first aid kit to cut it off, then wash it with soap. And then, finally, the food. It was all freeze-dried and in such quantity that he thought... With this, I could live forever. Package after package he took out. Beef dinner with potatoes, cheese and noodle dinners, chicken dinners, egg and potato breakfast, fruit mixes, drink mixes, dessert mixes, more dinners and breakfast than he could count easily. Dozens and dozens of them all packed in waterproof bags all in perfect shape, and when he had them all out and laid against the wall in stacks, he couldn't stand it, and he went through them again. If I'm careful, he thought, they'll last as long as... as long as I need them to last, if I'm careful. No, not yet. I won't be careful just yet. First, I'm going to have a feast, right here and now. I'm going to cook up a feast and eat until I drop, and then I'll be careful. He went into the food packs once more and selected what he wanted for his feast. A four-person beef and potato dinner with orange drink for an appetizer, something called a peach whip for dessert. Just add water, it said on the packages, and cook for half an hour or so until everything was normal-sized and done. Brian went to the lake and got water in one of the aluminum pots and came back to the fire. Just that amazed him being able to carry water to the fire in a pot, such a simple act and he hadn't been able to do it for almost two months. He guessed at the amounts and put the beef dinner and peach dessert on to boil, then went back to the lake and brought water to mix with the orange drink. It was sweet and tangy, almost too sweet, but so good that he didn't drink it fast, held it in his mouth and let the taste go over his tongue, tickling on the sides, sloshing it back and forth, and then down, swallow, then another. That, he thought, that is just fine, just fine. He got more lake water and mixed another one and drank it fast, then a third one, and he sat with that near the fire but looked out across the lake, thinking how rich the smell was from cooking beef dinner. There was garlic in it and some other spices, and the smells came up to him and made him think of home his mother cooking, and the rich smells of the kitchen. And at that precise instant, with his mind full of home and the smell from the food filling him, the plane appeared. He had only a moment of warning. There was a teeny drone, but as before, it didn't register. Then suddenly, roaring over his head, low, and in back of the ridge, a bush plane with floats fairly exploded into his life. It passed directly over him, very low, tipped a wing sharply over the tail of the crashed plane in the lake, cut power, glided down the long part of the L of the lake, then turned and glided back, touching the water gently once, twice, and settling with a spray to taxi and stop with its floats gently bumping the beach in front of Brian's shelter. He had not moved. It had happened so fast that he hadn't moved. He sat with a pot of orange drink still in his hand, staring at the plane, not quite understanding it yet, not quite knowing yet that it was over. The pilot cut the engine, opened the door, got out, balanced, and stepped forward on the float to hop onto the sand without getting his feet wet. He was wearing sunglasses, and he took them off to stare at Brian.
I heard your emergency transmitter, then I saw the plane when I came over, he trailed off, cocked his head, studying Brian, damn, you're him, aren't you? You're that kid, they quit looking a month ago, no, almost two months ago, you're him, aren't you? You're that kid. Brian was standing now, but still silent, still holding the drink. His tongue seemed to be stuck to the roof of his mouth, and his throat didn't work right. He looked at the pilot, and the plane, and down at himself, dirty and ragged, burned and lean and tough, and he coughed to clear his throat. My name is Brian Robeson, he said. Then he knew that his stew was done, the peach whip almost done, and he waved to it with his hand. Would you like something to eat? Epilogue The pilot who landed so suddenly in the lake was a fur buyer mapping Cree trapping camps for future buying runs. Drawn by Brian when he unwittingly turned on the emergency transmitter and left it going, the Cree moved into the camps for fall and winter to trap and the buyers fly from camp to camp on a regular route. When the pilot rescued Brian, he had been alone on the L-shaped lake for 54 days. During that time, he had lost 17% of his body weight. He later gained back 6% but had virtually no body fat. His body had consumed all the extra weight and he would remain lean and wiry for several years. Many of the changes would prove to be permanent. Brian had gained immensely in his ability to observe what was happening and react to it. That would last him all his life. He had become more thoughtful as well. And from that time on, he would think slowly about something before speaking. Food, after all, even food he did not like, never lost its wonder for him. For years after his rescue, he would find himself stopping in grocery stores to just stare at the aisles of food, marveling at the quantity and the variety. There were many questions in his mind about what he had seen and known, and he worked at research when he got back. Identifying the game and berries, gut cherries were termed choke cherries and made good jelly. The nut bushes where the fool birds hid were hazelnut bushes and the two kinds of rabbits were snowshoes and cottontails. The fool birds were roughed grouse, also called fool hens by trappers for their stupidity. The small food fish were bluegills, sunfish, and perch. The turtle eggs were laid by a snapping turtle, as he had thought. The wolves were timber wolves, which are not known to attack or bother people. The moose was a moose. There were also the dreams. He had many dreams about the lake after he was rescued. The Canadian government sent a team to recover the body of the pilot, and they took reporters who naturally took pictures and film of the whole campsite, the shelter, all of it. For a brief time, the press made much of Brian, and he was interviewed for several networks, but the Fuhrer died down within a few months and a writer showed up who wanted to do a book on the complete adventure, as he called it. But he turned out to be a dreamer and it all came to nothing but talk. Still, Brian was given copies of the pictures and tape and looking at them seemed to trigger the dreams. They were not nightmares, none of them were frightening, but he would awaken at times with them, just awaken and sit up and think of the lake, the forest, the fire at night, the night birds singing, and the fish jumping. Sit in the dark alone and think of them, and it was not bad, and would never be bad for him. Predictions are, for the most part, ineffective, but it might be interesting to note that had Brian not been rescued when he was, had he been forced to go into hard fall, perhaps winter, it would have been very rough on him. When the lake froze, he would have lost the fish, and when the snow got deep, he would have had trouble moving at all. Game becomes seemingly plentiful in the fall. It's easier to see with the leaves off the brush, but in winter, it gets scarce, and sometimes simply non-existent as predators, fox, lynx, 
wolves, owls, weasels, fisher, marten, northern coyote sweep through the areas and wipe things out. It is amazing what a single owl can do to a local population of ruffed grouse and the rabbits in just a few months. After the initial surprise and happiness from his parents at his being alive for a week, it looked as if they might actually get back together. Things rapidly went back to normal. His father returned to the northern oil field where Brian eventually visited him and his mother stayed in the city, worked at her career in real estate, and continued to see the man in the station wagon. Brian tried several times to tell his father, came really close once to doing it, but in the end, never said a word about the man or what he knew, the secret. 